Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurveda healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the show. We're here today with our Thursday episode where anything goes on this show. And today, what I want to do is I want to bring back our updates on the virus and if the second wave is upon us right now. You know, it's been about a month since I've given you updates and I didn't even know if I would bring you another show after my previous show because I really did lay out everything that I wanted to with what has been going on, what is going on, what will happen. The problem is the media has shifted its attention to something even far more fair mongering, which is what we've seen them do. And remember, this show has always been dedicated to to bringing you the truth. Not about what's most popular. These shows on the virus that I do get three or four or five or 10 times the amount of listens. So from a lot of people's media-based perspective, I should do more of them. But that's not what the Cabral Concept is dedicated to. I won't do that. That is not what I stand for. The Cabral Concept is about spreading positivity. It's about inspiring people. It's about giving people real actionable plans to let them know that there's always an answer to let them know that you can heal, that you will find your answer, that you have to keep looking, that you begin to explore other protocols. One protocol leads to another. And before you know it, you are well. You do feel great. You have the energy that you've always wanted to. That's what this is all about and explores that from a multidisciplinary perspective practice. It's not about party lines. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, that does not matter to me because all of us have the same wants. We have the same needs deep down. I mean, that's the truth. I don't think anybody doesn't want to feel a sense of calm right now to know that them and their family are going to be okay during this time. So the problem is when you listen to one media outlet or the other media outlet, it's always spun to their particular story. This side is good. That side is bad. Well, the truth is is not either one of those. So what we want to do is actually look at this right now, and that's what I like to bring you on these shows, from an actual factual-based perspective. Meaning like, I want to say numbers don't lie, but the truth is they do in terms of this particular virus. And once I started to share that with people, I started to get banned by Instagram, banned by Facebook, banned by YouTube. Meaning that They'll let me post, but they won't let me boost a post. They'll let me post, but they will only show it to 1% or less of the people that follow my accounts. That to me is censorship. Why should I not be allowed to share with people the truth? If I don't share one particular perspective, well, then I don't get brought up. Now, here's the thing too. Whenever you share a particular perspective, now they give you that kind of COVID warning right below your video or above on the top of Google. And again, I can't understand that because they show you one side of the argument. All I want to do is share with people perspective, share with people the truth. And if it is getting that bad, I also want to share it with people that same sentiment. You have to understand, when I was overseas in March and I started to do these updates, I can remember very specifically, I was in Australia. I was actually up in Noosa, this beautiful spot. I was visiting friends of mine. I was visiting Melissa and Nick, which many of you know, great people, hanging out with friends. Should have been having the time of our lives with my wife, my two girls. It's beautiful. We've wanted to visit Australia. I've wanted to visit Australia since I was in my early 20s when I really started to learn more about it. And But the problem is all of this now was stressful because we're figuring, can we get back in the country with them canceling all of these flights and banning people from coming in? Well, And back then, I shared with you the perspective, listen, we don't know what's going to happen. It is now time, I was saying, to be able to make sure that you get any supplies that you do need because we could be going on a full-out lockdown. And it did happen in many parts of the world and many parts of the country. But as we started to get more perspective, as the numbers started to get in, I tried to alleviate people's fears that this is not what it's being made out to be. It is not this 24-hour sensationalistic ticker on mortality, where many of the deaths, most likely at least 20% to potentially even 40% were being attributed to COVID. And there's a video being circulated from one of the heads of state actually sharing with people that any death 
that they believe to be COVID or anybody with a COVID-based diagnosis, even if they did not die from specific COVID-based symptoms, was to be attributed as a COVID-based death. So if you died from cancer or if you died from some other complication, but you also had COVID, you were labeled as a COVID death. If you had COVID and got into a car accident and you died, you would be labeled as a COVID-based death. We also found out that hospitals were being paid anywhere from 15 to 30 plus thousand dollars per COVID-based case. Even if the person was not tested, they were given money by marking it down that it was a COVID-based case. And remember, this is not even crazy to think about because a hospital is a private organization. They're a business. And if you're going to give a business a free $15,000 per case, of course, you're going to take it, right? I mean, that's just kind of simple economics and human nature. You're giving out free money. You need to treat the people anyways. Why wouldn't the hospital take it? Of course, they're going to do that. We also found out that a number of nursing homes had more cases attributed in deaths there than they even had beds in the nursing home, which is just outrageous. Some of them were even double the amount attributed there. And the biggest one, too, is that there's been no release on flu-based cases, which are similar symptoms to this particular virus. And again, you know that I'm not naming the particular virus because it simply gets me banned even deeper. Even less people are allowed to see the show. So here's the thing. If on a typical year, we've got around 40 million people to 60 million people just in the United States getting the flu, and we have around 40 to 80,000 deaths per year just attributed to the flu, well, how many of the 135 deaths in the United States are attributed to the flu? We won't know because they're not sharing those statistics. So what I'm saying is that this virus is serious. I don't want to downplay that after the intro I just gave. It is serious. But what I want to do is give you the statistics of who it's serious for. What are we really looking at? Is there a way out of this sooner than later? And that's what I want to share with you today. So again, at no point do I want to downplay the severity of this. I have two parents. Luckily, they're still both with me. They are in their 60s. Do I want them to make sure they take care of themselves? Absolutely. Are they potentially at a more at-risk state than other people? Yes, they are. With a history of autoimmune issues, yes, they are. So what I want to do is make sure they stay safe. What about my own family? Of course. You know, I know that the risk of me, my wife, my two girls, any of my siblings getting sick and dying from this is not high. But still, you don't want to take any chances, right? I mean, again, I think we're all in the same boat. Nobody wants to take any chances. That doesn't make any sense. That's just bravado if you say, oh, I don't care if I get this, where, again, we know that 70% of people that get this virus show no symptoms at all. But again, it's bravado to just say, well, bring it on. Let me get it. I don't think that that's a smart thing to do because it seems to affect everyone in just a little bit different of a way. It affects some teenagers, although very, very rare. And I'll share that with you. But if you're predisposed, if you have any other issues as a teenager, well, then this could be a potential issue as well. Again, super rare, and I'll give you the statistics, but possible. So what I want to do is, yes, this is a real virus. And again, I know that people don't like to hear this, but not radically different than the flu. Not radically different than the flu. The flu still causes forty to 80,000 deaths in just the United States alone. The flu spreads even, well, no, I shouldn't say even faster, because apparently this virus does spread faster, a two to three X ratio. And I have seen this, and so I do want to bring you those statistics. However, we're still not at a number yet that surpasses the flu. The flu is still three to four X where we're at right now, again, in the United States at least. So if we've got about 13 million cases right now, well, again, typical flu, 40 to 60 million, potentially up to 80 million people. So... Yes, there are those issues, but here's the thing. What what seems to be with this particular virus is its lingering effect and its severity in those people that are more at risk. And again, I want to share with you that today. So the biggest thing that we have to cover is this. The media has all of a sudden gone from having that mortality, that death rate ticker in the side of the screen, which, by the way, is just one of the most horrible things that you can do. It is simply clickbait. It's staying tuned in. It's you being nervous because you keep seeing that little number go up every, you know, every couple hours or so where there's a death. 
And the problem is this, is that they are playing on your fear. They know that this type of fear opens the loop. That's what they call it, opening the loop. And it makes you want to tune back in. Where are we today? Where are we tomorrow? And all it breeds is more fear. Well, now they know that the statistical mortality rate keeps dropping and dropping and dropping. That means less people are dying percentage-wise. Now, that's never changed, by the way. It's always been the same mortality rate. The difference is what? Well, the difference is testing. If the mortality rate is dropping by 3x, well, it's because we have a 3x climb. We actually have about a 7x climb. We have a huge climb in the amount of tests that we do. So you have to understand is that, let me see if I can bring up one statistic for you. When we're looking at the actual number of people that have died from the this particular virus, just over, let's say, the last four weeks, and I'll bring all this up for you right now. Okay, so why don't I do this? I'm going to link up all of these statistics, all of these reputable sources at stephencabral.com forward slash 1630. Head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 1630. You can share these statistics with friends, with family, with anybody who needs to see this from an unbiased perspective. So over the past month, and why don't I give you all of it so that you can really see how this climbed. In March of this year, March 21st, we had 561 deaths attributed to COVID-19. Now keep in mind, this is all deaths attributed. This means all of the people with flu, with COVID, with anybody they believe had COVID, etc. Well, we were at 561. Then on March 28th, we went to 3,126. On April 4th, 9,907. On April 11th, we went to 16,011. On April 18th, we went to 16,897. On April 25th, we went to 15,209. And that's per week, by the way. So I just want to stop here for one second. I gave you all of this information back then, not because I have a crystal ball or anything like that, but I looked at the statistics. I looked at the epidemiologists. I looked at all of the data, and I saw the curve that people who are very smart and brilliant in this area showed. And they showed that the peak was going to be the end of April. We talked about this on the show. I do hope that you were tuning into that because now we saw this precipitous drop right after that. On April 2nd, we're down to 12,969. Sorry, that was May 2nd. On May 9th, 10,949. On May 16th, we're now below 10,000 deaths per week. We're at 8,933. On May 23rd, we're at 6,932. On May 30th, 5,850. On June 6th, We're at 4,617, June 13th, 3,668, June 20th, 2,783 deaths per week for that week, June 27th, 1,463, and then last week, I'm recording this on July 14th, July 4th, we had 500, that week, last week, we had 522 deaths. Now, that last number will climb a little bit, maybe to around 800 to 1,000, because typically more are attributed over the course of the next week or two. So... The question then becomes, are we in the second wave? Like, is this the second wave? Well, here's the thing. The second wave is a media-based creation. The new normal is a media-based creation. The number of new cases will continue to climb. I talked about that a month ago. I talked about it six weeks ago, letting you know that the media will try to scare you with this because now the mortality rate's not coming up. It's actually dropping. Well, how can this be? Well, how can this be? Well, better treatment, earlier treatments, people worrying more about their health, all sorts of different things. So here's the thing, though. So the media knows this, so they can't keep you tuned in if they show the death rate going down, the mortality rate going down. So what do they do? Well, they talk about new cases. And now they don't even talk about the United States. They're talking about global mortality, global death. And now they're at, well, it's 577,000 people have died globally. Yes, yes, maybe. And attributed to so many other factors. And there's 8 billion people walking this earth. And unfortunately, and it is unfortunate, it really is. I don't like to think about this at all. But we all have an average lifespan of about 75 years old. That means we And I don't like to think about this either, but we are all mortal. And the average death in this virus is over 75 years old. It's actually between 78 and 81 years old. That means people, the average person dying from this virus is actually older than the average lifespan. And so when I look at this, I say none of this is good, right? None of this is good because every person who dies is a loved one of someone. This is a real person. 
right? And whether they are 78 years old or 81 years old, it doesn't make it any easier. It doesn't. Maybe a little bit easier than a child, but now we know that children really are not at risk. They aren't at all. And people who try to the media that tries to convince you that that's the truth is just, again, fear-mongering. I can give you this, real statistics, and this is as of July 12th. Per 100,000 people, the mortality rate, 0.75. This is based on uh, taking New York as a microcosm. 0.75 for 0 to 17. By the way, those are teenagers, not children that they're trying to say teenagers with pre-existing conditions. 18 to 44, it's 21.37. So that's the rate per 100,000. 45 to 64, it's 202.77. 65 years old to 75 years old, the rate is at 663.84. The rate at 75 years and older, it more than doubles, almost triples, just from 65 to 74. When you are 75 and older, the rate per 100,000 now jumps to almost 1,700, 1,668. So you have to understand that we are looking at about 50%, even a little bit more than that, coming from people over 75 and 75 years and older. And when you look at a lot of the epidemiologists who are finally now speaking up because they don't want to go down when history is written as saying that all of these particular deaths are attributed to COVID. They don't want to say that. They're saying that average length of life for many of these people that die from COVID may have decreased it by months, not years. Meaning a lot of the people that we're talking about are in a nursing home. When we got the big scare in Washington, it came from nursing home. When we got all of those, not all, of course, but many of those deaths in New York, we got those many from nursing homes. And that's because when the people are most susceptible or on top of each other, the living conditions aren't always the best, what happens is you have it spread faster. And when it spreads faster to the most susceptible people, you are going to get more mortality. We have to keep in mind that if we just look at last week with 522 attributed deaths, or even let's say it's 1,000, we have to understand that 8,000 people die a day in the United States on average from all sorts of different causes. This is one. For example, on any given week, we typically see between 50 and 60,000 deaths in the United States, 50,000 to 60,000 deaths per week. And when we look at COVID, we're looking at 522 for last week, maybe 1,000. The week before that, 1,463. That's for the whole week. So we, again, we have to put this all in perspective. I am not downplaying the severity of people that are most at risk. I'm not downplaying that. But what we have to understand too is that one of the reasons why this continues to climb in the media is that we have 7x to potentially 10x the amounts of tests. And then when you go over to John Hopkins University of Medicine, which is supplying a lot of the data here, we have to understand is that the United States looks like we have the market on COVID-based cases. And there I go. I said it. I'm probably now going to get banned. <laughs> but that's okay. I have to do what I have to do, right? But it looks like we now corner the market on that. Because we, again, I'll pull, up the, I'll pull up the site right now. I look at it every day just to make sure I'm keeping up. As of today, July 14th, 13,174,741,000 cases. Well, the United States has almost 4 million of that. How is it that the United States, how is it the United States has about a third, right? How is it the United States has about a third of all of those cases? Not quite, but, but close, right? Of all of those cases, when the United States has 330 million people or so out of 8 billion. So is the United States really that much more infected than the rest of the world? So that's, that was the question I had to myself, right? That's the question that I pose. And my mind says, stay unbiased. Use data. Use analytics. Use science. So I go and I say, well, let me look up all of that information without making any judgment. Let's keep an open mind. So I go and I look up, what is the testing like in the United States versus other countries? Well, lo and behold, there was the answer. As of today, the United States has run 43,500,000 tests. Most countries have run 1 million tests or less. A lot of the other countries might be a million or 2 million for a lot of the larger countries. And there's only one other country above 20 million tests, and that's Russia at 23 million, and they're coming in at 739,000 total cases out of the tests. 
again, if we look at the population of Russia, we look at the number of tests, which they've done a little bit more than half of us, if we double their number of cases, what do we see? Well, about 1.4, 1.5, that's less than 50% of what the United States is coming up with. So the United States, we have to be really careful of the numbers that we're getting here. And I know that's going to get me in trouble, but we have to be really careful with the statistics that the U.S. media and U.S. body is coming out with. Because the only country that's probably giving more false information would be China. Because they say they've run 90 million tests. So I just completely, again, I want to bring you that because it is the number they say. But again, we just have to throw that number out. Because you're saying China's run 90 million, 410,000 tests, and they only have 83,000 total cases. That hasn't risen since April. Come on. Right. I mean, again, you have to use you have to you have to just look at the mathematical model on that and science to say we know that the the virus originated there right we also know uh, how quickly this virus can spread and you're saying that you've done 90 million tests and only 83,000 positive that's the direct opposite of what the you know what the US is doing we're we're padding the stats and China saying nope nope no virus here you know again which is almost impossible which is why I want to share with you the next part to this okay the next part to this is this is what do we do right it, are masks the answer right and people ask me this all the time are masks the answer again what perspective do we want to look at this from? A psychological perspective or a science and facts perspective? Because if we're going from facts, the only mask that works is an N95. If we're using facts, if we don't want to use facts, then we can say, well, any mask is better than no mask. But that's actually not true. Okay, so I did a whole podcast on do masks really work? Okay, so definitely check out that show if you'd like. But the, the skinny of it is this. Surgical masks... They like to say, do work. And here's the thing. Surgical masks work for about 70%. That's because surgical masks do not fit tight to the face, which means that you can breathe in the air without it being filtered through the mask. So surgical masks have been shown for the person wearing the mask, if they were to cough or breathe, that those moisture-based particles, which can carry the virus, do not get passed through the mask, at least in a forward north-south direction for about 12 inches. What they don't test is what comes out the side of the masks. Convenient, right? Because those masks don't fit tight to the side of your face, which allows for about 30% of non-filtered air to come in, which means the surgical mask may protect other people from you if you have the virus, but it does not net protect you from getting the virus most likely, okay? So again, if we want to go by science and actual facts, those are the facts. I don't come up with any of this. This is research that I just keep an open mind to and I want to share with you. Now, the fabric masks are a whole different story. There is zero science behind those. And when I say zero science, I mean zero science because here's what the CDC, the best they can say is this, it's probably better than not wearing a mask at all. That, that's the science. It's probably better than no mask at all. But here's the thing, which they're not telling you. There is not a moisture-based barrier. Unless a mask is woven with a moisture-based barrier, it is not stopping the particles from coming in or out. So is it better than wearing no mask at all? If it is, it's percentage points. We're talking almost zero almost zero, until they come up with some science showing that, but it's not. And here's why. The fabric masks that our people are wearing as well, they fit loosely too. So if you have a loose-fitting mask, and it's not even the blue surgical ones that loop around the ears, it's, it's really then it goes back to psychology. So you ask me, again, is it better to wear a mask at all? If you want to truly, not, truly protect yourself from the virus, you're going to wear an N95 mask. You'll also wear gloves. You'll also not touch the inside of your mask and most likely, you're going to wear glasses because you're going to stop the virus from getting in through your eyes, your nose, your mouth, or touching it with your hands and then touching it to your eyes, nose, or mouth. Now, do keep in mind as well that all of this may not be realistic. You may not be able to get an N95 mask. They're also difficult to breathe in, right? You're breathing recycled air. 
So that, that's the issue. I'm going to get to this. I know this is going to be a little bit longer of a podcast. So then people ask me, so do you recommend wearing a mask? And here's the thing. I do. Because I'm human and I try to empathize with other humans as well. People are scared right now. You know the science. You know that the masks are doing nothing. You know that if you wear any type of mask and you cough or breathe and it comes out the sides of the mask and you're standing in line and then you have your whole social distancing, which by the way, unless you're outside, is, is an absolute uh, mockery of science as well to think that the virus can't stay in the air or the virus can't travel. An elevator in my building shows the two spots to stand on about five feet away. As if the virus can't travel five feet away. I mean, it's, it's insane. It's insane. Outside, a little bit different of a story, especially if it's humid. Then it will hopefully drop to the ground faster. But when you cough out the side of a mask and you're standing in line at Costco, and then you leave, and then the next person walks up, well, they're breathing in your air. And those particles, those viral-based particles are still in the air. So again, that's the science. But do I believe in still wearing a mask? Yes, when I go out in public. And I'm asked to wear a mask, which is basically everywhere. I wear a mask. Why? Because it's a simple thing to do that puts other people's minds at ease, that don't have the same information that you have, that are really worried. And if that's what I can do to put other people's minds at ease, I don't need to make a political statement. I'm not making one. I don't believe in either one side or the other. I believe they're both corrupt. That's, that's the thing. I have no hope in either side. What I try to do is do my best for the people, for us, for real people in the real world, not people who don't care if people lose their jobs, lose their businesses, lose all that. Because why? Because they're still going to be employed. You're still employed if you're in government. You're still employed if you're in politics. You're still employed if you're in media. But, you know, all the other businesses are allowed to fail. They're allowed to go out of business. But, you know, why? Well, you know, it's very easy as a celebrity to say, hey, stay inside, lock everyone down. Well, sure, they have nothing to lose. They already have millions in the bank. They live in a 10,000 square foot home and they have, you know, private chefs and all sorts of things able to be delivered. But that's not the real world. That's not real people, right? That's not how things work. So, you know, if you ask me, should you wear a mask? Yes, but from a psychological perspective. From a psychological perspective, and also, if you're around anyone that is susceptible, 75 plus, or you have pre-existing diseases like heart disease, high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, autoimmune issues, or overweight, all of those people are exponentially more at risk. Not for getting the virus, we're all at risk but exponentially more at risk for dying from the virus. There's a big difference between getting the virus and dying from it. 70% of people who get the virus won't ever know that they had it, okay? But, you know, 30% obviously do, and less than 1% will actually die from this virus, which, again, is not something that anybody wants to hear. So here's the issue, though. What do we have to do? And I'm going to reiterate this twice. There is no way. There's, like, there's only one way out of this, and nobody wants to say it because it's going to be unpopular and it's probably going to get me in trouble. But the truth is this. There's only one way out of this. There's only one way. If we're really being realistic, the virus has to move through the population and we have to get herd immunity. Now, before everyone gets upset at that, just hear me out. The virus cannot have any other hosts that are it's allowed to carry on. Remember, a virus isn't necessarily alive outside the body. What it does, is it, and I've talked about this before in the lipid membrane and all those things, but the virus enters a host, let's say a human. And that person then is where the virus gets to live on. Well, if you already have the antibodies because you've had the virus, well then that virus can't live inside you. Your immune system catches it, attacks it, it's gone, right? And that's how it should be for every healthy human. And then if you were come in contact again, it's this, again, we don't know for sure, but it's most likely not going to phase you if it's like all other viruses for the most part, right? You're not going to get it again, the same exact one, not with this type of corona-based virus. It hasn't happened yet. Well, maybe this will be the first, but it has not happened yet. We have no reason to believe that that will happen. And we also know that asymptomatic carriers is not an issue for the most part. So worried about kids, you know, children seeing their grandparents. If the children don't have symptoms, it's typically not an issue at all. So there's a lot of things we can put our mind at ease about. But here's the thing. We can't allow for this virus to have any more hosts. So there's a lot of people out there 
looking for the vaccine. Now, again, I'll let you do your own research on that. But if you look at phase one trials, I would be a little bit leery about those results. And I would also be a little bit leery about what they've tried to do in the past for uh, corona-based viruses and the success rate that they've had. So there's that side to it, which a lot of people may lean towards. And that's, again, I always provide you with the data and then I want everybody to make the best choice for them and their family. But that is most likely not going to be here in time. It's just not. I mean, that would be honestly a medical miracle. It really would. And it would mean that they probably been working on this for quite some time for that to happen. What I have to reiterate and state is this, is that as, as, as the majority of the population, 99 plus percent of the population, is going to be okay if they get this virus. We need to, again, I hesitate talking about this because I always want the best for people. That's the truth. But there's only one way out of this, truthfully. And that's that we have to get herd immunity. We have to give this virus no other place to go. And better during the summer months where we can get outside and get vitamin D than during the winter when people are more susceptible to mucus, more susceptible to lower levels of vitamin D. So... The thing is, if we continue to lock down and we go in lockdown, out of lockdown, listen, if you were to tell me in the very beginning now, I know hindsight is twenty twenty, that we would all lock down for two weeks, it wouldn't be good. But okay, that would probably stop the spread. But we can't go half lockdown. If you allow people to go grocery shopping, if you allow people to still come in contact, you're never going to stop the spread. It's not going to happen. That is not reality. You'd have to do a big lockdown like New Zealand did and other places. But again, does that even matter? Well, probably not. So we're doing all of these lockdowns. All it's doing is slowing the spread. Do we want to slow the spread? Well, the answer to that should be yes. If hospitals are inundated, if hospitals are inundated, then yes, you need to slow the spread because we need to make sure that those people that need to be hospitalized and they need oxygen and then they need medical treatment, that they get that, right? We need to make sure there's enough beds, but it's a rare place right now. I know there's a couple of cities, but there's a rare place right now where hospitals are over inundated. It's simply not the case for the majority of the world and certainly the majority of the United States. So what do we do then? Well, the thing is this, healthy people need to continue to boost their immune system. Even though there's a 99 plus percent survival rate for this virus, it is a good wake up call that if you're overweight, that if you have inflammatory based issues, that if you have any of the top cause of mortality, whether it be heart disease, type 2 diabetes, uh, being overweight, which predisposes you to a lot of these things, high blood pressure, you need to take care of them. I mean, you honestly do. If you smoke, you have to stop smoking. And the reason is that it just makes you so much more susceptible. So this is a giant wake-up call for all of us to get healthier, to protect our immune systems. And yes, it does give you a much better chance of survival, but also continue to help The people that you know, whether it's a neighbor, whether it's your parents, whether it's your grandparents, anybody 65 plus, definitely 75 plus, you take protective measures around them. Yes, you wear a mask around them if they're susceptible. Yes, you go out, do the grocery food shopping for them. There's no need for them to put themselves at risk right now, especially when you, if you're a healthy adult, especially under 55 years old, there's not a lot for you to worry about. Yes, you might get sick. Yes, you might be out of work for a few days, but you're going to recover for the most part. Is there any guarantee? There's no guarantees. That's why we're all trying to take our precautions. But the next time something happens, it could be worse. So let's take our precautions now. Let's learn from this the best we can. And let's stay away from all the media-based mongering. Remember, they're trying to tell us that the next wave is here, that this is spreading, that this is getting worse. It is spreading. It is spreading. Should we be worried about that? Not if the mortality rate continues to decline. Because we are going to get this over with sooner than later. And that's the truth. Again, I know, but it's so unpopular to say that. And I know how ridiculous it is for me to say that right now, but you have to understand we can spread this out over years or we can move through this at a faster rate while protecting those people that we know are most at risk. We already know who is most at risk. I've talked about that on a previous podcast, protect those people, keep those people safe. We can get to herd immunity without those people getting the virus. We can do that. And we can allow this virus to die out. We can boost our own immune systems, right? And we can test to see with an antibody test to see if we've already had it. If now we know that, listen, we're good to hang around our parents. We're good to hang around other people. We've already had it. Hey, we didn't even know we had symptoms or it felt like a minor cold. So all of these things are becoming available to you.
I do recommend testing, not, not to see if you have it at the moment. Of course, if you have symptoms, yes, but run an antibody test. See if you have these specific things. Begin to just shine some light on this. And again, I know this is not the popular rhetoric. I know it's not. But please know that it is coming from the heart that all I want to do is help people, that there's no political bias, that there's, this is just complete statistics, and it's the only way that I know to help us get through this at the fastest way possible. So again, if my team can help out in any way, just let us know. We answer questions every day at cabralsupportgroup.com. You can email us at support at equilibriumnutrition.com. You can check out the Integrative Health Practitioner Institute, whatever we can do. You can check out the daily podcast. However we can help, let me know that. And again, if this has been helpful, please do feel free to share this show with anyone it can serve. Thank you so much. Take care. I appreciate all of you. Ever wonder what the best sauna, blue blockers, sleep trackers, wake lights, salt lamps, or other health gadgets are? Or what about the top non-toxic mattresses, sheets, soaps, bath products, toothpaste, and cookware? Or would you like to know the cleanest choices for hemp parts, meal delivery services, supplements, and much more? I personally curated, researched, and now created a resource page of all of my top picks that continues to grow each week. These are the exact products I use in my own life, with my family, in my private practice, and they're the ones I trust. To find out all of my up-to-date recommendations, and all the details, simply head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash resources.